Hi everyone and welcome to another video. I'm Lorraine Maguer and today I'm going to talk about the things that I have done for the Invisible Cities project for China and Egypt. But before we start with that, I have a couple of announcements maybe? Well, a few things have changed. First of all, I have gotten myself a camera. So before I was filming on my computer and now well, hopefully this changes, uh, this upgrades the quality of the image and I don't know yet what it means for sound but from what I could tell it was fine so I hope you like it too. And second of all, you may have seen, I have gotten a logo. Uh, so I asked a friend of mine from my real life book club, Claudia, who makes very pretty and cute art uh, to make a logo for me. and. This is the result. Uh, I absolutely love it and I really like her style in general. I also have uh, this little piece from her postcard that I put into a thingy. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I really like what she's been doing and I'll link her Instagram down below if you want to see more and if you are in the Netherlands, you can get some of these. So that is that. Uh, now let's talk about Invisible Cities. If you don't know, Invisible Cities is a project uh, hosted by six people, I believe, and I'll link the information down below. Uh, but the idea is to read a couple of countries a month, three countries always picked, and uh, you can read books, you can watch movies, you can make food, you can listen to music, you can do whatever, in with the idea of learning more about the world and reading more translated fiction. And I am grouping two countries that I have read in this month and I'm going to group them always by two from now on. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about China and Egypt. So for China I have read the book The Last Quarter of the Moon by Shi Xiang. So this is about uh, the life of a 90-year-old woman. Uh, so she comes from a nomadic tribe in the north of China they have uh, reindeers and they move around every couple of days uh, and, and live this very different lifestyle and this book is, I think it starts, it's mostly in the 20th century because as I said she's 90 now. And the tribe is called uh, the Evenki, so she is an Evenki woman and uh, at the beginning of the book her, the group she lives with is still normal size, there is a kind of shaman person, um, there is a leader, the men have certain types of uh, chores that they do, mostly hunting, and the women do other chores, but as the time progresses we see her life, so finding a husband and all of the social constructs in her group, uh, but there is also the influence of war and of modernity, Mod modern modernity, is th yes that's the word, uh, so for the war side, at one point the men in her tribe are taken away by the Japanese, I believe, and they have to stay in camps for a couple of months a year to train. Uh, and for the modernization we see that mostly in the latter part of the book, uh, the Han Chinese want them to live in certain uh, villages and want them to go further south and want to have this sedantic the not nomadic lifestyle and how some of the people want that, how other people want that and the differences between certain generations. Uh, so that's very interesting. One of the things that I found surprising in this book is also you get to know the people in the tribe a bit and a lot of them are hurting for different reasons and a lot of them also therefore have kind of find solace in alcohol and I was surprised at the amount of alcohol that there was in this. And uh, because they are so, because of this nomadic lifestyle and living so close to nature, I really liked also seeing their link with nature and with life and death. So I really enjoyed this. It's not really a very fast read. There isn't a lot happening, but it was very. I really liked getting to know this woman. We never really learn what her name is, uh, but seeing what this nomadic lifestyle meant for different people, and um, I liked also that. In the tribe some people are very good friends and have very close I mean they all have very close bonds obviously uh, but that doesn't keep there from being very big struggles so yeah I really like this book and also I really really like this cover uh, it really shows the beauty of the nature um, however I will say before you dive into this uh, there's also some trigger warnings because there is some uh, violence towards children and women so uh, and there are also a couple of deaths of 
uh, children or babies. Uh, so you might want to um, know that before getting in. But otherwise, I would recommend this uh, also because it is about the style of not necessarily Han Chinese, but another part of the country. So that's this. Um, now, I didn't really watch a movie. Um, there is a documentary series in the Netherlands that is made by Ruben Terlau, and I think now is already the third season that was going on right about now on TV, and in the first two it was acting in China, so Ruben Terlau, uh, it's called In the Leven, the world of the Chinese, this one, and in the first two he went from east to west and then from north to south or something like that, and showing different parts of Chinese life, and explaining it a bit to us Dutchies or people living in the Netherlands and in this season he went to visit different Chinese communities around the world so the first one he was in Kenya uh, he went to Cambodia he went to the US to Italy to Serbia and then to the Netherlands I believe those were the countries that he went to and what I really liked is so he showed why the people were there so sometimes it was looking for a better life in the Netherlands with uh, oftentimes uh, people that wanted to have more than one child because they were victims, we could say, of the one-child policy. Uh, but in Kenya people were sent there to uh, work for the railway stations. Uh, and so there were different reasons for going abroad and some people had their family with them, others people weren't, uh, were on their own. And what he does also is that he doesn't only show the Chinese side because he speaks Chinese fluently and it's always a lot of fun to see this tall Dutch guy walk up to a group of Chinese people and then start speaking Chinese fluently and then everybody like, wait, what? Oh, okay. And then just answering his question because he has a very open mindset. So he, he meets the Chinese that are living there and he shows how some really like their life there. Others would prefer to be back home. And he also talks to the local community and there also he shows the people that really take issue with the Chinese being there for different reasons. Uh, but he also talks to the people that really like learning about this culture. So in Kenya he talked to a girl that was going to Chinese school, that was learning Chinese, that really wanted to go to China, that was learning dances, etc. Uh, and in Italy, for example, he showed how people in certain villages um, the Italians really felt like they were being taken over and they weren't to a certain extent because he, Ruben spoke to a couple of Chinese women uh, asking them about a Chinese flag that was hanging around and they said, oh yeah, that's the foreigners. Like, oh, no, <laughs> they're not the foreigners, they're the Italians in Italy. <laughs> they're allowed to be there. Uh, so all of these differences was very was very interesting and I really like he has a very open mindset about it. And um, so yeah, I loved watching that documentary um, around this time. And I have made, as for food, uh, I made Chinese dumplings, vegetarian Chinese dumplings with uh, Chinese cabbage and mushroom and there was some soya sauce in there and other things. Uh, and I made the dough for the dumplings myself and I think that might have been a mistake because they were still very sticky. And while the thing itself was delicious, I mean, I really liked it, I really liked the taste, I think I think that was... I'm proud of myself for that. But I think that the... the yeah, the dumpling itself, the dough part, I don't think what I made was a dumpling. But it was still good. And I really feel, I feel kind of conflicted about this because it does feel like I'm destroying someone else's culture. I mean, when a non-French person does something to a croissant, does something weird with it, like putting cheese on it, I'm kind of angry. So I'm very sorry about my dumplings. And I look forward to really eating real ones at one point. Now, let's go to Egypt. For Egypt, I read uh, Palace Walk by Naguib Mahfouz, and this is the first book in the Cairo trilogy, and it is set uh, in the 1920s in Cairo, and we follow a family. We follow uh, the father, uh, his wife, and three children. No, four children. Five. Five children. Uh, three boys slash men and two um, women. Um, and the father, he has two lifestyles. So the, he, at home he is a tyrant, 
and there is a very oppressed atmosphere and he really imposes certain things on his children so uh, but I'll talk about that and on the outside when he's outside um, his friends know him as this very nice very open always laughing always partying um, kind of person and he's not conflicted about that he doesn't notice how different what he says and what he does is so for example one of his daughters at one point gets a marriage proposal and he is offended because how can that man know that she exists that is not possible and he on the other hand meets women all the time and he's always in some kind of affair um, so that tension is very interesting and there are a couple of things that happen that kind of test the relationships in the family how he and how his sons also he has two elder sons and one younger one how they see women is also not great at best um, there is first of all they're very interested in voluptuous women which is I mean on the one hand I'm happy that it's okay not to be skinny and that's the preferred thing on the other hand the way that the women were still described was still very objectifying it was still just, ah, la, big big bottoms blah 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 and uh, yeah not necessarily my thing I don't really like that so, so there's things like that that really show this tension and you really get to know the characters very well so that makes this that I still would want to continue with the trilogy not necessarily because I found the characters likable because I don't uh, maybe the women the women were very interesting one has a very one of the uh, daughters has a very loose tongue um, so I really like that but I like Naguib's writing because he really he shows us all of the thoughts that go through mostly the men and even though you don't understand their thought well don't understand you don't agree with their thoughts or their acts I thought it was very well shown and at the end of the book we also get uh, the background of the Egyptian Revolution um, so I read a bit, a little bit more about that and it was very interesting. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of enjoyed the book. At the beginning I was, I thought it was a bit slow, but once I got into it, I liked it. And just when I got used to the slowness and I thought it was a very, um, yeah, slow moving, more atmospheric book, things started happening and a lot of things started happening. And it was also, as always, very enjoyable to, uh, I was buddy reading this one with a couple of people on the Discord. Uh, app that we have with the Invisible Cities project and that also really helped me also enjoy it a lot more. Uh, as for food, I made some koshari, which is made with pasta and rice. And you can't ever have enough carbohydrates, so I was very interested in this. And there's also uh, tomato sauce, lentils, chickpeas and crispy onions. And uh, in the tomato sauce there should also be vinegar, but I forgot that part. So again, I think that what I made, it was fine. I didn't, I didn't really, I think the vinegar would have added a lot more shape and color to the whole thing. Now, I, I, I don't know, there was something that I missed. I wouldn't necessarily make it again, although it was still very good. And I will definitely make more things with crispy onions. And somehow it is very satisfying to me to see that mixing pasta and rice isn't very weird. I mean, it's not, I can't really taste the difference, but maybe my taste buds, they're just very weird. And uh, we watched the movie One and a Half Hours, it, which was on Netflix, and it's a weird movie, and I don't know what I think of it yet. So we have a vast cast of characters and they well most of them go take the train on this in the movie and it is uh, the period of one and a half hours before an accident happens uh, and um, an accident with the train happens and so we get to know all of the reasons for those people to be on the train we get to know their lives they're mostly very poor people so you see a lot of how they struggle and why they struggle and what that means for their family um, and you see why the accident happens and you kind of get an inkling, although you don't see what happens after the accident, you do get an, an inkling as to what it will mean for the families of all of these very different characters. Uh, and the idea apparently behind the movie is that at the time, I think it was the 1990s, uh, there were a lot of um, accidents like this in Egypt uh, and a lot of 
people would die, but there wouldn't be in a, any attention to the deaths behind the number in the news. Uh, so all of these lives would just end up in the newspaper and then be used as, as a medium to uh, transport falafels. So I think the idea behind the movie was very interesting and I, I knowing that I could appreciate it more. But the movie itself, it was kind of overly dramatic at times and um, you switch from person to person really quickly and I didn't really know would they be linked? Should I be interested in all of these characters? What was going to happen? I didn't really get a feeling for that. And uh, my boyfriend didn't even watch the whole thing. And also what what, what was weird, the, the acting styles of some of the actors was very different. Some were overly dramatic and I wouldn't know is that just part of how people are because other people would not be like that. Is this just the acting style? And there was a lot of yelling. I don't know if it's the Arabic or Egyptian. There's something about the language that to my ears makes it feel kind of aggressive all the time. Um, and they were speaking very loud as well. So I really had the impression throughout the whole movie that there were just a lot of angry people yelling at one another. I don't really know. And I don't know, therefore, also whether I liked the movie. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing because I'm noticing that I'm having the tendency right now to try to put things into yes or no categories and this movie shows that that should, does not necessarily have to be the case so I really like the message behind it but the dramatic aspect was not necessarily for me um, but yeah it's an interesting movie um, so in that sense I would recommend it and I it did give me insight into at the atmosphere on Egyptian streets and the type of ways that people would live, if that makes any sense. While I'm thinking about it right now, I didn't really listen to a lot of music, either Chinese or um, Egyptian, which I did do in January, so maybe I should do that. I'm still doing um, Colombia this month, I'm still reading book, etc. Uh, so maybe I should uh, listen to some Colombian music. I'll try to think of that. Uh, anyway, links to the books to the recipes and to the movies are all uh, in the description box if you're interested in anything else. Uh, if you're also partaking in this uh, project or if you are in another way um, have any knowledge about these countries because of another book or another movie that you've seen, I would love to hear your experiences uh, because there is so much more to learn than what I am seeing and I'm loving that so I would love to talk to you. Anyway, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye! Pa-chum, pa-chum, chum.